So I attended an AI party in the middle of the American desert and it was pretty fun actually. Wait, I'm not talking about this desert. I'm talking about the Damn. desert city of Las Vegas. Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. I'm not kidding. This city is actually in the middle of a desert. It's pretty insane. There were about 30,000 people from all around the world at this AI party. I got to sit inside the Las Vegas Sphere, which is this giant spherical LED screen and got to experience the future of AI and filmmaking. I got to listen to world leaders speak and even got a chance to interview the guy who created the internet, Windsurf. I got coffee brewed and served by a robot, sat in a Red Bull Formula 1 simulator, had AI analyze my basketball shots, built Lego and had Gemini commentate my build, and also got to witness a street magic show right in the middle of a tech and startup expo. And that, by the way, was not the craziest thing I saw. There was this zone where if you're stressed, you could literally go and play with puppies to de-stress yourself. It was wild. This AI party hosted by Google is called Google Cloud Next and it's Google's biggest startup and developer focused event in the world. In this video, I will take you behind the scenes using my press pass at Cloud Next and show you what it's like to attend probably the world's biggest startup and developer meetup. And throughout this video, I will share four of my biggest learnings and insights about the AI space from having attended this global event up close and personal. If you're a startup founder, a developer, or someone who's building in the AI cloud space, you'll surely find it useful. But even if you don't belong to one of these profiles I mentioned, I'm sure you'll find the experience vlog style video entertaining. At 100X Engineers, we believe we have some of the smartest audiences in the country and the world. And we strive to bring top quality content from across the domain of AI. So sit back, fasten your seat belts and relax, because we are landing at Las Vegas. Firstly, a lot of you would be wondering, why Las Vegas? I mean, it has a reputation for being a party and a gambling city, right? The reason is quite simple. For an event of this scale, where 30,000 people attend it, there are very few alternate options for a city. You need infrastructure for the event itself, hotels where attendees can stay, food catering, etc. at a massive scale. And Las Vegas happens to be the perfect city that offers all of that. In fact, quite a lot of businesses and tech conferences are hosted in Las Vegas, like the Consumer Electronics Show, National Association of Broadcasters, and the Global Gaming Expo. The city has one major road called the Strip, where all major hotels, restaurants, and places of entertainment are at. And everything happens around the Strip. Let's start with the Sphere. I'm sure you've seen the Sphere on Reels and YouTube videos, but if you haven't, let me introduce you to the world's biggest screen. It is so big that the screen is a whole spherical building. This thing is wild. It can accommodate 20,000 people, has a mind-blowing 16K by 16K resolution, has weather simulation inside it, haptic seats for realism, and can even stream individual audio at particular seats. On the event day, the Sphere was displaying Google Cloud animations, and guess who was inside it? Sundar Pichai. Sundar gave a short and funny speech and proceeded to reveal something that really blew my mind. You guys need to hear this. I've never felt so large and so small simultaneously. Google using AI collaborated with The Sphere to bring back an 86-year-old classic movie to the dimensions of The Sphere. The movie was The Wizard of Oz. Now, I remember having seen this movie as a kid on Pogo TV, but if this is the first time you are hearing about it, man, it's a classic. The thing is, this movie was shot in 1939 with a 35mm camera, and they had to show it at The Sphere on a screen that is 160,000 square feet wide. Huge challenge, right? So, one problem was how do you upscale the footage from what it was to 16K? The original footage is so old that it'll be pixelated as it is, and now there's a Herculean task of adapting it to 16K. Another challenge is the screen at the sphere is so huge that you can't simply take a video that was shot in a rectangular format and show it there as it is. The sphere screen is spherical. It covers far more surface area and far more elements of a shot than what you shoot in a rectangular format. 
so every single scene had to be expanded and the new details on the expanded frame had to be outpainted using AI. Outpainting is a common technique in images where if you want to expand a frame and show what's outside of that frame, you can basically do that. And Google actually did this. One of the fascinating bits of this challenge was there were certain scenes where there were multiple people in a room, but not everyone would be shown in the frame all the time. So in a rectangular frame, you don't really have to show everyone in the room unless they have a significant role to play in that scene. But the size of the sphere demanded that they be shown on screen most of the times. So these characters had to be AI generated. They had to be outpainted from their previous references. And this data had to be cleaned up to make it look like they were actually there. This is some complex image and video generation along with some high grade upscaling algorithms. It requires a ton of compute and Google had to invent some of these solutions as a screen like this had no parallels before. This was the first time anyone was ever trying this out. And guess what? They actually played a trailer to the movie which was outpainted and adapted for the sphere. And it'll be available for the public to go watch the sphere from August in 2025. Seeing all this while sitting inside the sphere was a really surreal experience. Right? This, like the seats were moving, there were weather simulation, it was crazy. But seeing all this made me realize something and here's my major insight. With generative AI, filmmaking is a space that will have a transformation that is unmistakable. And in 2025, this space is moving faster than ever. Today, it is nothing new for you to see a model generate videos that would have taken filmmakers and animators hours or weeks or even months in order to create. Video generation has gotten much better in 2025 than what you actually saw in the previous years. And when I saw this collaboration between Google and the Sphere, I got exposed to a bunch of these features that are not yet available to the public or they haven't been productized yet, but I know that they actually exist, which is an indicator of how fast this field is actually moving. One thing that I believe is going to happen with these video AI models getting better is that there's going to be a new class of AI filmmakers. People who actually use prompts, modify these videos in order to make entire films. And this capability is probably like a year or two away from everyone's hands. It truly democratizes the process of filmmaking. Imagine if you could control every shot, every scene, every tone, the, the color grading, the character consistency, the camera motion, everything. And what this experience showed me was that there was a lot of things that were going on in the back end that these companies will probably figure out how to productize later on but they already exist. Like the capabilities are far beyond what's available to the public. And it's only a matter of time before it get into our hands. And by, by the time we actually get it on our hands, the technology would have evolved even further. Next up, we have the keynote. The Google Cloud Next keynote took place inside a stadium. And man, when I entered it, it kind of felt like I was there to watch a boxing match or something. Huge oval arena, dim lighting, a lot of people, it was, it was, it was mad. Here's where both Sundar Pichai and Thomas Kurian, the CEO of Google Cloud, gave their keynote addresses, followed by multiple Google senior execs launching products. The most interesting ones were the Ironwood TPU, Agent Space, and Firebase Studio. The Ironwood TPU was pretty crazy. It exhibits a 3000x more performance than its predecessors, a massive improvement, and it offers 25 times more compute power than the world's largest supercomputer, El Capitan. Agent Space was another crazy tool that they launched that day, and it enables anyone to create and deploy agents using any model. They even came up with something called as Agent to Agent Protocol, where agents across multiple workflows could communicate and perform tasks autonomously. What I really liked about this was that even though Google has their own model called Gemini, they didn't restrict users to use only their model. You could plug in pretty much any model and it creates this open ecosystem where you can build freely. My key insight in this section was how everything is becoming more and more agentic. There's an entire ecosystem being built to house, ship and manage these agents and a lot of the demos there were also centered around agents. 2025 has been the year in AI where agents make their debut into the hands of consumers and developers and it's definitely coming true. Soon everything we do in our daily lives will have an agentic flow to it and this is just the beginning. If you are a developer, I would highly recommend you start learning agentic workflows as this is something that will become commonplace in the industry. And if you're a startup, I'd recommend you to use some of these frameworks, identify which part of your company can be automated and deploy a few test agents to increase productivity and reduce costs. I truly believe that in a year or two, we will have specialized agents for many of our tasks. My favorite analogy is that of a Pokemon trainer. I think in a few months or maybe like a year, everyone will be like a Pokemon trainer where they have these multiple Pokemons that they are going with and taking them to work. When I say Pokemon, think agents. 
So let's say if I was a marketer, I would have one agent that helps me brainstorm. I would have one agent that actually helps me run ads in an optimized manner. I would have one agent that helps me do SEO, etc. So I feel like every job role would actually come with a bunch of staple agents. So it's almost like you're a Pokemon trainer and you have like these five, six Pokemons that you can deploy whenever you need them. And it's only a matter of time until we actually get there. Nevertheless, everything I saw at this event reaffirmed my belief even more strongly that the agentic era will be coming in a big way. So brace yourselves. Next up, we have the Expo. And this was one of the most fun bits of my experience. Imagine a small town where every house was a startup and a few playgrounds here and there. That's what this really felt like. And boy, there were so many companies here. There were pretty much every top global consultancy company like Accenture, TCS, Wipro, Infosys, Quantify, and also tons and tons of cybersecurity companies like Palo Alto Networks, etc. Heck, even Anthropic, the company behind Claude, had a booth over here. And there were some really cool playgrounds as well where I could actually go and try some of the cool stuff. At the Oracle booth, I sat in a Formula One simulator, which is as close as you can get to sitting in a real F1 car. These guys have their huge logo on Max Verstappen's car. I saw this competition area where there were four players on each of the four sides, and you have an object that you have to build out of Legos. It could be a spaceship, a boat, or something like that. And next to your building station was a phone that actually sees what you're building, which is connected to Google Gemini. And as you're building that thing, there's a time limit, as you're building that thing, the AI makes funny comments about your building skills, and at the end, it decides who's the winner. That was really fun. There was this one company called Elastic that hired a street magician to pull up the crowds and promote their product in a very interesting way. And it was pretty cool. I, want, I actually want you guys to see it. Time that you look at Elastic, speaking of time, is that your watch? There was a company called Wiz that was into cybersecurity who made their boot look like a retro movie DVD store where they changed names of popular movies to fun cybersecurity versions like The Wolf of Cloud Street, Guardians of the Gateway instead of Galaxy, um, or The Dark Net instead of The Dark Knight. It was pretty cool marketing. And the craziest thing was there was a zone called the Puppy Pen where there were a bunch of puppies and you could go cuddle and play with these puppies in case all these tech talks were stressing you out. Most companies here were building something based out of the Google Cloud ecosystem. They were basically sophisticated wrappers built around Google's cloud and AI ecosystem, but packaged as services. So you don't just get a product, you get a service where someone helps you to use the product in order to drive better results for your companies. And that brings me to my third insight. Building a straight up product is still risky. A lot of things need to go right for it to work out and generate revenue. For every successful cursor or perplexity, there have been hundreds of similar products that failed. Almost every company here was a service-based company that runs on an agency model which provides end-to-end -end solutions along with consultancy. Or they were well-packaged wrappers on top of Google Cloud's ecosystem with a service angle where they help you drive better results. These are the kind of businesses that are actually generating revenue. I don't mean to discourage you here. I know that every developer and founder has this inkling to build the next big product of the century, but it's pretty high risk when it comes to doing that. Whereas if you package services the right way, you have a business that generates stable revenue from the get-go. So this is something that was reaffirmed when I was there. The last part was about the people I met. I met a lot of interesting founders, senior executives, and even developers. And I had a bunch of interesting conversations with all of them throughout these three to four days that I actually spent over there. But the most interesting two people that I met at this uh, event was Windsurf, who is the creator of the internet, and Mo Abdullah, who is a vice president of uh, Asia Pacific at Google. And I actually got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with both of them for half an hour, and they were some really insightful conversations. With Windsurf, it was an absolute fanboy moment. I mean, this guy literally created the internet, right? He's 81 years old. He's been working at Google for the last two decades as an evangelist and as an advisor. Uh, so a lot of the insights that he would actually have would be something from a high level. And he's someone who's really seen and has been exposed to this digital era like no one else has. 
and he had some pretty interesting things to say. We've actually released the entire podcast uh, of the conversation between Vint and me. You can actually go check it out over here. I highly recommend it. It's a fun conversation. I had a lot of fun doing it. Next up, I had a similar conversation with Mo Abdullah, but this was much more focused on the engineering and the startup side of things. I got a lot of things validated, which I had theorized on earlier of how we are actually in the agentic era, what Google has been working on behind the scenes, etc., etc. And I have a full podcast uploaded with him over here as well. So you can go check that out as well. That being said, I just wanted to show you one last cool thing. This, by the way, has nothing to do with Google Cloud Next or Las Vegas. This is something that I saw at San Francisco International Airport. I was just walking by and I saw this booth which didn't have a person. It was basically this square shop-like thing with a bunch of coffee makers and stuff like that. And there was basically this robot arm that was actually making coffee. So I got curious and I wanted to actually drink that coffee and see what it's like. So I just gave it a shot and it was actually one of the best coffees I've had. Like this, all I had to do was just pay whatever and choose whatever coffee I want and it basically made my coffee and gave it to me and I drank it and I just thought it was something that I had to include in this vlog style video. All in all, I had a really fun time at Google Cloud Next in Las Vegas. I got to meet a lot of people that I otherwise would not have had the chance to. I got to see a lot of Google's tech that they don't really, you know, put it out there uh, in the public or they choose to sort of show it to a small group of people. I got to experience that firsthand, so that was really cool. And a lot of these insights I gathered from there were not really groundbreaking insights. It was more like affirmations and validations of things that I had already thought about. But I hope they've been valuable to you guys who are actually watching this. Also, if you want to see more content like this on your feed, hit the subscribe button, give this video a like and stay subscribed.